Hello, I'm Professor James Danziger from the University of California, Irvine. I'm a political scientist, and it's my pleasure this morning to discuss with you the question of globalization. Let me start with a couple of questions. Where in the world are you, and where do you want to be? About a year ago, I was traveling in the south of India on a train, and in the middle of the night, we were all woken by a scream there's a fire, there's a fire. We all had to grab our bags, jump off the train, and walk about two miles along the tracks in the middle of the night into a small Indian village in the south of India. By the way, do you know where India is? Can you close your eyes, imagine a global map, and put your finger right on where I was? I hope so. I hope there's about 70 or 80 countries that you now, or at least by the end of this semester, will be able to find in that in that envisioning. Anyway, we grabbed our bags, we walked into this little town which was just waking up. I don't think they had ever seen Americans before, and here we were, a bunch of about 12 of us, standing around in the center of this dusty village. Pretty soon, we were surrounded by people. Most of them were little kids, well, between the ages of six and probably your age of about 12 to 15. And they were all dressed in white shirts, black pants or black skirts, carrying a little satchel. They were all getting ready to go off to school. They were thrilled to see this group of foreigners and began to talk to us in incredibly good English. Remember, this is a little village in the south of India. So we're asking each other questions, and I started asking them about their schooling. What kind of courses are you taking? And the 12 through 14-year-old said, well, we're taking calculus. Wow, I thought, that's a pretty impressive class for a 14-year-old to be taking. What kind of, what kind of a uh, calculator are you using for the class? They looked at me and laughed. Calculator? Our, professor, our teachers don't allow us to use calculators. They want us to understand fundamentally how this math works. So we have to do this calculus by using our brain and paper and pencil. I was stunned. I remembered how much challenge it was for me to do calculus in high school with a calculator. And it struck me then that this was another example of what's going on in many countries around the world right now where education is fundamentally important. And that's why we hope that from the Global Connect course that you will be taking, you will see what kind of education you need to be where you want to be in this world that is emerging. I have a couple of questions that I want to start with. As you start your freshman year in high school, do you have 2020 vision? What do you think I mean by that? What I do mean is, what life do you hope to have in eight years, in the real 2020? Will you have a clear idea of what you need to do to achieve your goals in the changing environment of the global system? What education do you need? What goals do you need to pursue? How is the changing nature of the world going to either help you or hinder you in achieving the successes that you have with your life goals? Here's a quote from Bill Gates. I'm sure most of you know who Bill Gates is, the super brilliant entrepreneur who created Microsoft. Here's what he had to say about this issue. When I compare our high school education to what I see when I'm traveling abroad, I'm terrified for our workforce of tomorrow. In the international competition to have the biggest and best supply of knowledge workers, America is falling behind. He's talking about those kids in India and the ones in China and in Africa and in South America who are working hard, building skills, and will compete for the best jobs in this global environment and their countries will be competing with the United States to be more dominant in that global system. Therefore, today I want to explore two themes with you, two broad questions. First, what is globalization? And secondly, what are the social sciences? How will Global Connect use the social sciences and the knowledge that they have produced to enhance your understanding and knowledge of the world in which you will live as global citizens? Let's start with big question number one. What is globalization? In general, it can be understood as either a state of the world, 
a way in which things are, or as a process of change, and we need to understand it in both of those contexts. But fundamentally, what is globalization about? It's about networking. The world now in the globalization model is a vast set of integrated pieces, of interdependent elements that link together in a variety of highly complex ways. Now, these networks and the elements that compose them transfer, that is, they move around at extraordinary speeds, nanoseconds, and borders don't matter. The California border, the United States border, nothing matters because these move across vast distances in extraordinarily rapid speed. Now, when scholars talk about globalism and globalization, they have a variety of different ways of discussing it, but we can focus on four particular modes, frames within which globalization occurs as being some of the most important. These are economic globalization, sociocultural globalization, environmental globalization, and military globalization. Well, what do each of these mean? Economic globalization is about the long distance flow of goods, of services, of capital, which usually means money and funds, but also can mean technology and information. These shape the way in which we produce things and exchange things. Social cultural globalization is about the rapid movement of people, ideas, images, information, again, across these vast differences so that they influence the way individuals and groups and societies think and their points of reference. Environmental globalization is about the long distance transport of various kinds of biological elements and ideas that are associated with the way in which the environment functions and operates. So it could be things like the way ozone is moving or depleting in the atmosphere. It could be about the way that a certain kind of a biological product is shared around the world. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And military globalization is the way in which now the capacity of country, countries and military groups to reach far out across space with their military capabilities, either sharing them or using them in uh, mechanisms of force and violence, is occurring in ways that it were untold of throughout earlier history. So we need to understand then, how are these four modes working? What drives them? And fundamentally, how does this matter to you? But before we launch into answering those questions more fully, let's look at the four key facilitators of globalization. On the left, you'll see four acronyms. And I wonder if you can recognize what they are and what they mean. If not, by the time you finish the Global Connect course, I certainly think you'll understand how important each of them is to globalism. On the right are four icons. Can you link up those four acronyms with the four icons? Let's look at each of the four briefly. First of all, ICTs. This is Information and Communications Technologies. These are the various ways in which all of the digital world is being blended, transmitted, modified, in a variety of ways. So here we're talking about computers, cell phones, satellite transmission systems, and so forth. So which does it link with? Well, obviously with the mobile phone, which has become the critical element for communication in many of the countries of the world now, where there are no landlines, and therefore the mobile phone becomes the critical element for not only talking to your family and friends, but doing your banking, getting health care, advice, and so forth. Some people say there have been three great revolutions in humankind. The first was the agricultural revolution, where the technologies of irrigation and crop growing made us stable in our environment. The second was the industrial revolution, when machines enormously increased our capacity to produce goods. And the third, it's argued, is the communications revolution, which we're experiencing right now, and which is still moving at hyperspeed. 
The second acronym is IGOs. These are intergovernmental organizations. Now that means that the members of these organizations are states, not states like California, but states like the United States, Brazil, Cuba, China, Zaire. There are about perhaps 300 permanent IGOs of major consequence in the world. Which icon is an IGO? It's the icon of the United Nations, one of the most powerful and important of all the IGOs, which also include, and here's a bunch of acronyms that you'll learn about, the WTO, NATO, the EU, WHO, the IMF, NAFTA, ASEAN, the list goes on. The third is NGOs. This is non-governmental organizations. Now that means they're not run by states, but rather by groups of private actors who have a particular interest or concern that often has a global element to it. These non-state actors would be things like, which one of the four icons? Amnesty International, which is concerned about human rights issues in countries around the world. It could be Doctors Without Borders. It could be Greenpeace, the World Wildlife Federation, or Al-Qaeda, which is also an NGO with a very different agenda. And finally, and certainly important, are MNCs, multinational corporations. These are large private firms that do business across national borders, often in many countries. So the icon here, one of the big MNCs, is Coca-Cola which is in over 150 countries in the world as a product that is sold. Now the important thing to understand about multinationals is they are enormously impactful on the global economy. If you take the 100 biggest economies in the world, whether they're countries or corporations, more than 50 of them are corporations, not countries. They have huge impact and increasingly their loyalty is to their stockholders making profit, not to any particular country. And countries increasingly find it very hard to control these multinationals. So among them, these four key facilitators are critical drivers in the way in which globalism and globalization are evolving. So now let's get back to you, you in this 21st century, you in this globalizing world. <clears throat> so here's a series of questions. Should you care if Brazil allows more people into the rainforest? Well, I would care because the Brazilian rainforest is not only the source of many of our plants and species, which are slowly disappearing as the rainforest disappears, but it's also one of the crucial elements to our global breathing system. And as the rainforest diminishes through logging, through farming, through the increasing Brazilian pressures on it, it affects every one of us. Should you care if Russia rebuilds its military forces? Well, for Russia, this matters because they want to return to being one of the superpowers. And when the Soviet Union broke up, so too one of the most powerful militaries in the world that rivaled that of the United States. As Russia's military becomes more strong, it creates impacts all around their enormous border, which links with Europe, with Asia, with China, and ultimately with the United States, because as Russia builds up its military forces, we feel pressure to build ours, and the tension between these two countries can grow. Should you care if Greece defaults on its debt? Greece is part of the Eurozone and part of the European Union. And the European Union is the single biggest economy in the world. If Greece does go down and the Eurozone goes into crisis or collapse, that affects the entire global system of finance because banks everywhere are linked to what happens with Greece and the Eurozone. And economies are linked everywhere to what happens in little Greece. Should you care if India increases the salaries of its senior information technology workforce? 
You might care because many of us assume that the best jobs in the world, the best jobs in the United States, will be jobs that are associated with communications technology. India, those kids that I told you about before, is training huge numbers of highly gifted people to take those jobs. It means those Indians won't come to the United States to work for our companies. It means that some of our people will go there to work for Indian companies. And it certainly means that there will be huge impacts on one of the driving sectors of American financial vitality, its information and communications technology sector. There's a great quote in uh, the book by Thomas Friedem, Friedman, I will give you some more quotes later, where he says, when I was a kid, my parents said, eat your vegetables, the kids in China and India are starving. What I tell my kids is, study hard, the kids in India and China are starving for your jobs. And what about China buying up all the metals in Australia? and buying up a lot of land in Africa and New Zealand as they're doing. Well, if they control those markets of food, of critical minerals for making various important products, who has the capacity to build those products in the 21st century and who will be left out? So what China does matters enormously, as I'm sure many of you already recognize. I'm trying to persuade you that you are in this globe of globalization in fundamental ways and that it matters to your future enormously how it evolves and how you strategically decide to fit into it. Here's the other quote I mentioned from Thomas Friedman, three-time Pulitzer Prize winner with important books like The World is Flat. Globalization has one overarching feature, integration. The world has become an increasingly interwoven place, and whether you are a company or a country, and I want to add, or an individual, your threats and opportunities increasingly derive from whom you are connected to. This system, also characterized as the World Wide Web, and we have gone from an international system built around division and walls to a system increasingly built around integration and webs. You can see yourself as being in that web. Are you going to be able to move with facility through it, or are you going to be trapped by it? There are several big questions associated with globalization, and social scientists, as I'm suggesting to you, grapple with these all of the time. Fundamentally, these questions all revolve around one question. Will globalization produce more benefits or more harm for you, for your family, for your country, for the world? So let's look at a few examples and just see some of the ways in which both sides of this debate play out. Because some people praise globalization and others find it the most dangerous force that exists in the world today. So global trade, competitiveness, and outsourcing, and out offshoring of jobs, and so forth. Capital moving around at breakneck speed. Here's one tiny example. After class, or in the privacy of your own bedroom, look at all the clothes that you're wearing. Where were they made? I'm guessing that for most of you, the great majority of your clothes are made outside of the United States. Now, how does this process works? work? In the United States, a textile worker on average makes around $8 to $10 an hour. In the Dominican Republic, where we used to get a lot of our clothes made, that worker makes about $2 to $3 an hour. In China, that worker makes about $2 an hour. And in Bangladesh, that worker makes about $0.75 cents an hour. So you're a big global company and you want to produce goods, where are you going to hire textile workers to make those clothes? And you as an individual, when you go into your favorite store and see quality goods, are you going to buy a more expensive product from the United States rather than buying the equivalent product that's much cheaper because it was produced by a worker in a country where wages are much, much lower? As more and more of this kind of globalization of the economy goes on, everything changes in terms of where the jobs are, where profit goes, and how we benefit. So you benefit from those nice clothes that aren't too expensive 
and a worker in, the, in Bangladesh benefits because they get a better wage than they have ever gotten in their life making those clothes for you, or those shoes, or that computer. Now what about the movement of people and ideas? Well, the good thing is it enriches culture. Guess what percentage of the world's legal immigrants, legal immigrants, come into the United States relative to all the other countries in the world? What percentage do you think it is? 5%, 10, 20? What do you think? The fact is right now, 50% of the legal immigrants who leave one country and go to another country are coming into the United States. That's our long tradition, bring me your poor, your huddled masses. The United States will provide them with opportunity, advancement, the American dream. But immigration, besides enriching our culture and providing us with lots of good restaurants and an interesting set of people, has a downside. Because what is one of the hottest policy debates in the United States? It's immigration. How many people should we let in? And what about these people that are coming in illegally and therefore in some ways harming our culture? As people cross borders, as people move from one country to another, they both provide benefits but also can provide challenges and policy concerns that we all must be attending to. Now what about the environment and globalization? Well, there's good news. The Green Revolution, which allowed technologies from the advanced countries to spread out throughout the world, has enabled a lot of countries to produce three or four times the grain yields that they produced in the past. Thumbs up. But there are also some downsides to the way in which bioproducts move across borders. For example, there's more issue about whether gen genetically modified goods and foods are healthy and safe or dangerous? And where will this GMO operation end when we start cloning not merely pigs that are fatter and juicier, but also people? And here's one I want to ask you. What's your favorite end of days scenario? That is, what's your imagined view of the time when the world comes to an end? What happened? Now, some of you may say, well, it'll be aliens coming from another planet and killing us all off. Someone might say it'll be an asteroid hitting the Earth, creating a huge cloud that kills all the plants and animals and ultimately us. Let me tell you my favorite end of days story. It's a pandemic. Somewhere in the world, probably somewhere in the global south, a new virus will emerge and because everybody's jumping on and off airplanes and sending products right and left at hyperspeed, this virus will spread globally at a much faster rate than we find any cure for it. And it'll be a deadly virus, and ultimately it will kill almost all of us. Maybe not the cockroaches, but most of the humans. That's globalism, because now Viruses can be transmitted every time an airplane takes off and lands, every time a, sh a ship with containers arrives at your ports. This is a new situation that's much more dangerous than anything we had in the past. And finally, what about cooperation and conflict? There's one model that says the more we get to know each other across borders, across cultures, the more we understand each other and we cooperate and we like each other and we understand each other and the world becomes a bigger, warmer, happier place. That's a good feature of globalism. All of the tourism, all of the transportation mechanisms that allow us to move back and forth. But there's a lot of evidence that the more we get to know each other, the more hostility there is, the more anger and frustration and fear we have of each other. There's plenty of evidence from global terrorism, for example, and for the clash of cultures that people like Samuel Huntington talks about, that our ability to connect much more fully in this globalized world is actually producing more conflict and more potential risk for us all. So in this world of benefits and harm from globalization, how will the US fare? How will California fare? And most importantly in today's discussion here, how will you fare? You remember I asked two questions. One was about globalization and the other was about the social sciences. So let's look at the social sciences for a little bit. 
the social sciences. Social means that it's about people, that the core content and interest of social scientists is to understand people, individuals, groups, larger collectivities, how they think, how they act, how they interact, how they make decisions, how they frame the world in which they live and how they then operate within that world. And science. So the study is people and the technique, the method that's used to try to study those people is the scientific method, which is one of the different ways we can know around, about the world. There are other ways to know about the world, intuition, experience, some authority structure that you believe in, a teacher, a holy book, a constitution, whatever. But what science tries to do and what the method of science is all about is that it first of all tries to be empirical, which means it relies on things that it can measure concretely and not things that are somehow abstract and imagined or not capable of hard measurement. Secondly, it searches for patterns. It assumes that the world is not just totally chaotic and random, but that there are connections, that there are ways in which things can be generalized about and broader statements can be made than everything is just a one-time event. And so it's looking for ways to understand how things link in more generalized fashion. That's the patterns. Thirdly, science is testable. If I make a scientific claim, I lay out in front of you in a transparent way, here's my assumptions, here's how I collected my data, here's my data analysis, here's my conclusion. Now, what do you think? If you can find any problem with any aspect of that logic, I yield to you and say, okay, I don't really know what I thought I knew. But as long as those presumptions stand up, that analysis, those inferences, the data stand up, others accept that as part of this cumulative knowledge base that we're building. And also science is less biased. Notice I don't say it's without bias because all of us, no matter what we're studying, no matter what we're observing, we carry biases, which means our own predispositions and our own values, and so they enter in. But what science tries to do and scientists try to operate in terms of is a system where they create as few biases as possible in the way that they think and in the conclusions that they make and that they try to highlight any biases that they do have. So science is the method, people are the subject, and that's what the social sciences are all about. So obviously they're a prime frame for trying to understand the issues of globalization. I told you at the beginning that I'm a member of the School of Social Sciences at the University of California, Irvine. Here on your screen, you'll be seeing a picture of the buildings of the social sciences on our campus at Irvine, and also a list of the undergraduate majors that we offer in the School of Social Sciences. You'll see they range from anthropology through sociology. Each of them has a slightly different perspective on what aspect of human existence they want to study, on what methods and techniques they're going to use, but all of them contribute to our better understanding of people, of groups, of global society, and therefore our ground zero for making better sense about what's going on with globalization around the world. The class that you will be taking through Global Connect and the coursework that you will have has been developed by social scientists at the University of California, Irvine, and also them working with building upon taking ideas from other social scientists around the world. You are going to be in a situation where you will be provided with cutting edge knowledge from social science. Your teacher, as is suggested, has been willing to allow the School of Social Sciences faculty, the professors, the undergraduate students, and the graduate students to produce and deliver ideas, information, workbooks, topics for you to explore and develop as you try to better understand globalization. Cutting edge knowledge means that the people who are at a university are trying to push the borders of what we know 
are not merely reporting on what others have found through social science, but actually are doing their own explorations to take it even a step further. And in some ways, I would like you to decide at the end of your work with Global Connect that Global Connect itself is a cutting edge effort to try and help you become better informed about the world in which you are living and you are emerging with. Global Connect as a curriculum for a high school student has two semesters. The first one focuses primarily on globalization, what we've been talking about here, and the second on international relations, which we've touched upon because international relations is essentially all of those interactions that occur across the borders of countries. So whenever we engage in an interaction with Spain or Germany or China or Brazil in the United States, those are part of international relations. When the United Nations tries to decide whether to use its troops, its peacekeeping forces to intervene in a crisis somewhere around the world, that's international relations. When countries try to decide how to respond to Iran's interest in building a nuclear weapon, that's international relations. But broadly understood, international relations can also be when Coca-Cola decides whether they're going to take a plant that they have in the United States and move it to Mexico. So, Global Connect will help you better understand globalization, link it up with international relations so that you can better understand the world that we've been talking about here. The Global Connect group of faculty, students, have put together a series of books which will help to facilitate your understanding of globalization and international relations and the geography of the world and the other topics that are associated with the most interesting issues that are emerging. So for example, there's a book on China, the new juggernaut. There's a book on the Arab Spring, where the countries of the Arab Middle East rose up generally in citizen revolts against their regimes. And now there's tremendous chaos in these countries like Egypt and Tunisia and Syria as they try to reorganize themselves. By the way, Thinking back about that do I care list, Brazil, Russia, India, China, they were sandwiched around Greece, but they were chosen for a reason, because those are the four so-called BRIC countries, B-R-I-C, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Many scholars and financial analysts say that in the middle of this century, by about 2050, they will be the four big powerful economic forces right up there with the EU and the United States. And so, of course, they merit particular interest from us. This semester, we hope that Global Connect <clears throat> will help you. It will help you to understand the forces of globalization in general, but also, more specifically, how do these forces affect you? We hope that we'll help you to improve your game plan that is, your strategy as you move from being a freshman in high school and work your way through the high school process and then to the next steps. The next step might be college. It might be an entry-level job where you apprentice in a skill for a career. And then the steps beyond that, perhaps graduate school, professional school, and beyond that with three question marks. And why do I put three question marks for those next steps? Most analysts argue that the generation of young men and women who will reach the job market when you do in four years, six years, eight years, will be in such a turmoil of environmental change, of global change, of economic restructuring, that no one can imagine what the jobs will look like then. And no one can fully predict how many different types of jobs you will have before you reach retirement, assuming my pandemic doesn't occur, when we get there in 40, 50, 60 years from now. So you'll probably have somewhere between five to 10 quite different jobs in your adult life. And the transition of what kind of jobs those are in a country like ours is again, something we try to understand in social science, but aren't really sure about. As recently as 1960, more than half of the American workforce was engaged in doing something with their 
hands and their skills to produce a physical product that you could see. Now, less than one out of five of our workforce produces anything physical. And it's expected that in 10 or 20 years, almost none of us in the United States will pr produce physical things. So that means if there are any jobs for us, they're jobs that are gonna come out of your brains, your creativity, your innovative capabilities. This is the work of the future. And what we hope is that as you understand the way the world's changing and understand and develop your own skills, you'll be able to make those next steps with facility and with success. I hope that this discussion helps you to begin to think through not only what your strategies are, but also how you're going to fit into this broader and changing world of globalization. We truly hope that Global Connect will connect you with that global system in positive ways and give you insights about how you can prosper in this changing world.